and welcome back. Now today here's an interesting little item. This is called a rotary encoder. Now what is a rotary encoder and why is it so great for Arduino projects? When you want something that can adjust the value up or down and as a bonus have a little push switch as well. Let's find out. So here on screen it's where I actually bought this item. This is from Gearbest. Um, rotary encoder, it's a keys rotary encoder, very, very common. You um, can find them all over the place. As you can see, they're extremely cheap. Um, comes with these little DuPont cables as well, I might add. So you get even better value for money. But at the end of the day, what is it and how does it work? Well, for that, we've got to think in two dimensions. Now, first of all, Imagine that this was just a single switch that opened and closed when you rotated it like this. So it's giving out a series of pulses every time you turned it. It was going pulse, that is to say high. And then as you turned it more, it go low. And as it, as it sort of clicks into position, there are many, many positions or stops on this. I don't know how many, probably 30 maybe or 20. Every time it moves to a new position, the switch on here would go high and low. Now, you can probably figure out that the Arduino can test for that and determine, ah, oh, something's happened, you've turned the switch. So even on that very simple example of just having a single pulse coming out here, high, low, high, low, you could increment a counter or fade uh, an LED. However, it wouldn't be much use if all it did was give a train of pulses. You need to know the direction. So I'll be going clockwise or anti-clockwise or counterclockwise if you really must. How do we know that? Well, in here there are effectively two switches offset by 90 degrees in terms of what the pulse looks like. So as you turn it one way, clockwise, the pulse we first of all mentioned goes high and low. And whilst it's going high, the next switch comes in and goes high or low. I can show you this on the screen actually a little bit better with this little picture, which comes from Hobbytronics. Um, they've got one of these for sale in the UK, but I didn't like their sketch, so I've written my own. So if you can see here, look, there are two switches marked A and B. And as you turn this, as you turn this little knob, the A pulse starts and it goes high. And before it comes to rest, the B pulse has started as well. So the best way to determine whether this is moving or not is to say when pulse A goes low, that's on this line here, what is pulse B doing? Is it high or is it low? Well, in this instance, as you can see, as pulse A goes low from high, from 5 volts down to ground, pulse B is high. And we'll take that as being we're moving in a clockwise direction. So that as you move the pulses onwards, so here again, pulse A goes high. We don't care about that. It stays high for a little while. We don't care about that either. But as it falls down to ground, it's now low. What's pulse B doing? Ah, high. So now we are still moving the clockwise direction. Now imagine we were doing it the other way around, this counterclockwise. I don't know why it says counterclockwise there, considering this is a UK site. But if we were doing it anti-clockwise, or turning it this way, What's going to happen? So the pulse from A, this switch here, still on the top line, as we turn the switch anti-clockwise, it goes high, we don't care about that. But as it goes low, we detect it and go, right, what's pulse B at the moment? And looking down here, we can see, ah, it's low. That means we must be going anti-clockwise. So if we continue to turn, it stays low, we don't really care about that. It goes high, we don't care. It stays high for a little while as we turn that one little increment on the air. We don't care about that, but as it goes low, the Arduino can say, ah, you've just gone low. What's pulse B at this instant? Low as well. 
that means we're going anti-clockwise. I'll leave you to uh, think about this little diagram and what it means to when we go clockwise stream or anti-clockwise stream. It's very clever and basically it all relies on the fact that the switch marked as B is 90 degrees out of phase with the first pulse switch here. Just offset. And that allows us to determine whether we're going clockwise or anti-clockwise. Okay, enough of the theory then and where we bought it from. What else can we say? So looking at the code window, we can see that we've defined our two pins from pin A and pin B. And it's important that this pin A is defined as either pin 2, pin 3, there might be one more, but it's, it's for an interrupt routine on the Arduino. But we'll come to that in a minute. So we've got a, a switch on pin 8. You don't have to use a switch, of course, but as it's there, I thought I'd demo it. We're going to keep track of where this rotary value is. Remember, this hasn't got a sort of a start and a stop position. It's just relative to where you start from. Now here we're keeping track of what the rotary value is, which is an arbitrary value because after all, this rotary switch doesn't have a start and a stop. It just goes round and round and round, delivering those trains of pulses. So we're arbitrarily going to pick between 0 and 100, which is what I've coded this for, but it could be absolutely any value you liked. So we're going to say we're starting in the middle of 50, and the virtual position of this, which is what I'm saying, there's no real position, we're going to say is 50 as well. So the last position was 50, the current position is 50, so no change. Now here, you can see in this big blob of code here, it's an interrupt routine, which basically does everything there is to know about what happens when this pulse train starts. As soon as you move this, this interrupt routine here will get called, there's a little bit of check in here to make sure that we don't call it more than once every five milliseconds because you could get some bounce on the switches here. So that's all that this is doing up here. And then we're saying, OK, you've, I've been triggered. Therefore, we know that pulse A is on the move. But which direction are you actually turning this clockwise or anticlockwise? And this is where we read pin B. If it's low, then we know that we're going anti-clockwise or counterclockwise. Otherwise, we must be going clockwise. Now, I'm incrementing and decrementing by one here, but you could do it in multiples of five or ten or whatever it is that takes your fancy. That's not the problem. The, the thing here to note mainly is that we can detect whether we're going clockwise or anti-clockwise. Now, this little line here it just takes the minimum and maximum value between 0 and 100. So if it's below 0, we're taking 0. And if it's above 100, we take 100. So it effectively um, puts a limit on what we can do with this. You, however, can do it from a minus a million to a plus a million if you want in steps of 500. It makes no difference at all. This is purely a, a logical thing that we're doing here. And then here, we're just keeping track of the time, as I said, so that we don't run this more than every five milliseconds or so. So in our setup, we're first of all setting the serial monitor just so we can see something on screen. So the rotary pulses are both inputs. Uh, the switch on the center, this, this pretty clicky thing, that is a floating switch. That is to say, one end is connected to ground, but the other open end is just a piece of wire. There's nothing connected to it at all. So your pin that you've connected this to that you've connected the actual switch to, which we've used here as pin 8, is just floating around, which is not a good idea because that means that value could go up and down just arbitrarily, just with noise. So what we're going to do here is say it's an input, but please use the pull-up resistor built in to the Arduino. That stops us having to use any kind of resistor on board. For us, it's just using the built-in one. And of course, when you press it, it shorts that to ground, and therefore pin SW will be low. Here's how we attach that interrupt routine that we saw above. What we're saying is attach the interrupt routine. This is the preferred way of doing it now. Rather than specifying, specifying an individual timer or pin or anything like that, 
you have to use, or I recommended to use, the digital pin to interrupt, and we're using pin A. Have a good read about this. It's just a recommendation on the Arduino site itself. This is the routine we want running, and we want to initiate the interrupt when that value is low. So as we turn this knob, and pin A produces a pulse, it's the low state we're interested in. As it goes low, the interrupt will be initiated, and then it will look at the pin on pin B. And we're just printing something here so we know when things are running. Now, the main loop is extremely simple. All it's doing is saying, has my position changed? This line here. Has my position changed from last time? And remember, the thing that's updating that position is the interrupt routine. If it has, print it. This bit here is looking at the switch, saying, have I pressed the switch? If I have, reset whatever the, the virtual value is at the moment to the midway point. Simple as that. It's not difficult. Now, if you can see this code, most of the code that I'm scrolling up and down here is comments. The actual lines of code that are running here, out of the 85 lines we have on this page, I would say 50 of them are probably comments. So it's a very, very small amount, but you are getting exposure here to a nice little interrupt on pin three. Um, and let's see it working in action. There we are, start. That was at the end here, look on line 59 at the end of our setup. So everything's ready now. I'm waiting for this switch to move. All right, so here's the wheel. So as I turn this wheel now, clockwise, you immediately see now it going up from that midway point of 50 to which we arbitrarily set it to. So as we turn it, it goes all the way up and it will go all the way up to 100 because it will just keep counting forever if we let it. But I've said 100 is enough. That's the midway, that's the maximum point. And if I turn it now anti-clockwise, you see that it goes down. Now what happens if we spin this wheel? What happens if we really try and spin it? Now I'm going to spin it anti-clockwise. So as you can see, it's it's going down, but probably not counting all the pulses. We're doing it too quickly, I would imagine. Rather that, though, than it getting the pulses wrong. Because otherwise, if it tried to do too many, what has happened, apparently, according to the Arduino forum, is it starts misreading the pulse train from B and thinks that it's going in the different direction to what it is. There's bouncing of the switch to contend with, and we don't need any of that. So here we have it. We're going up, and then we're going back down again. Up, or clockwise, and down, or anti-clockwise. It really is that simple. And if we press the switch, we said it's going to reset it to the midway point. And there it says reset, and it's from 50. Easy peasy. Now, what could this be used for? Well, it could be used as a simple, trivial example, um, showing how to dim an LED, for example. So let's stick an LED in here and upload a different routine and see what happens. So here I have an LED. Actually, it's a nice pink one where well, it's clear at the moment. And I've defined in our code a new pin here with pin 11, which is a pulse width modulation output for the Arduino Uno pin. So we're going to put that in there and see what happens. So pin 11 and ground. You notice I haven't actually got any resistor on there at the minute because I reckon with that pulse width modulation, you're only getting tiny fractions of the pulse being generated. And I think this particular LED needs a slightly higher voltage anyway. So all things considered, I think we're going to be pretty safe. So let's have a look to see what's happening. So let's just fire up the serial monitor with our new code. And it says start. And you can probably see that LED there. So let's turn the old wheel. Oh, that's quite pink and bright. So if we turn it down a bit, 
as you can see, well, I hope you can see, if I take my hand out of the way at least, that the LED is getting dimmer. Although, quite frankly, it's still quite visible, even at 8 out of 255. One off. So it can't actually go lower than one anyway, that brightness, which is which is pretty dim actually. So if we bring it back up, there it is, getting nice and bright all the way up to 100. That is pretty bright. And all the way back down again. So there we are. A, a good example of what can be done with a rotary encoder. It just produces this stream of pulses that we can interpret. And I do recommend that you look at this code to look at how we've set it up with the interrupts as well, because interrupts are very, very useful. And whatever you do in an interrupt, well, basically don't do anything in an interrupt that isn't absolutely strictly necessary. So in here, all we're doing is ensuring that we don't come in more than once every five milliseconds. And then we're updating this virtual position global parameter that is then dealt with by the main loop. Was that easy? I'll say it was. That was easy. Good. Have a look at the code attached to the video at the bottom of this. And thanks for watching. I hope you're finding these videos useful and interesting. Remember, you can leave comments down below and also click that little button that says subscribe. Okay, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.